Okay, welcome everyone to the Ontology Summit 2020 fall series. Um, so we're going to be begin today with a presentation by uh, John Sawa, uh, basically just a large collection of diagrams that uh, he has very thoughtfully uh, put together for us. Um, Hello. So John, go ahead. <laughs> I'm Ravi. Okay, well, actually, uh, uh, we were going to be discussing various diagrams. So uh, what I have on those slides is uh, uh, 47 slides with uh, almost as many diagrams. And I'd just like to ask anybody who's interested uh, which ones they think are interesting because I'm, I'm not going to go through all set 47 slides. I'll just bounce around on anything anyone likes. Uh, so just I'd open it up for just look at them. What are they? Okay. Well, John, uh, among all your diagrams and slides, are there any that help um, narrow down how we should understand the notion of knowledge graph? Uh, well, the uh, basic question is, uh, I don't have any specific thing about knowledge graphs themselves. They're, a knowledge graph is just a, uh, uh, is just a version of logic that has a very simple sort of form. So the question is, what is it? that we're trying to do with them. And so these slides just cover a, a wide range of things that people are interested in. So what, uh, in, in fact, why don't you just look at slide number two, and that uh, just presents the problems that uh, everybody has been uh, concerned about. Slide number two? Yeah. Um, History of well, you systems? know, slide one is just a title. Oh, so that two, uh, slide two says history of interoperable systems. And we have a timeline. And here. what, yeah, and what it basically says is there is a major, major problem that nobody has been able to solve the problem of interoperability in detail. Although people, computers have been interoperating. Uh, successfully uh, from the uh, uh, punch card days, people have been sharing data, but they just share data on the basis of just uh, ordinary uh, descriptions in ordinary language and without the assistance of any kind of formal ontology. So the question then comes up is, what, if anything, can a formal ontology do to help? Well, I think you're you're simplifying the whole problem of interoperability. There's different dimensions of interoperability. So we can get technical interoperability, syntactic interoperability, social interoperability, and so on. And then of course right. the issue of semantic interoperability, which is the real killer or a real right. block. Right. Okay, so uh, if you Allow me to speak for a second. Sure. Ken, could you please uh, upload my slides? I said. Oh, I'm in the process of doing that. Give me a second. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate that. You may want to look at that too. Some of John's okay. work is used in creating those. Pardon right. Yeah, both uh, Ravi, Ravi has more um, uh, that is less detailed than John's and mine is rougher still. So, um, so maybe we can your... start with, we could start with the something else other than John's and then John has detail to um, okay. follow through. Yeah. Okay. Okay. One point I did uh, also want to do, uh, and uh, as Todd was mentioning that uh, that's simplified, but the point is that uh, look at slide number three that has a reality check. And the problem is that a single universal ontology is more of a hope than a reality, and that there is no 
hardware, large hardware software system that has a single uniform ontology for every, every component of the system. We don't have any such thing even for any software system of any kind. Just take Microsoft. Is there an ontology for Windows? Is there an ontology even for a window uh, for, let's say, MS Word? And the point is there just isn't. And uh, I think they come. Yes? There is not. Pardon? There is not. There is no ontology for these complex There's no windows. There is no ontology for any complex system of any kind that is uh, yeah. that goes into the details. And the only thing that we have, uh, and that is primarily the reason why WordNet or say any kind of terminology is as good as anything because uh, uh, just com uh, an, an, a comp that uh, when we get down to the precision, we only can have the precision at a micro theory level, at the level of the uh, uh, smaller micro theories. And if you notice the comment on slide three by uh, Yanovich and Hitzler, meaning is not static, but it's dynamically reconstructed during language use. As we're using language, the meaning changes. We should exploit the power of the semantic web technologies and knowledge patterns to establish interoperability between purpose-driven ontologies without having to agree on a universal level before. And I think that is the essence of knowledge graphs. They don't have an ontology. They have, uh, their ontology is just basically ordinary language. And uh, uh, that's about as, as good as you can make it for something that's at the level of just sort of sharing knowledge um, among the uh, any ev everything on the internet. Yes, um, good, good job. I think you have a lot of things on this uh, deck of slides that I have also looked at by through your uh, your web addresses that you gave us, as well as by searching a little bit on the OMG and other. Uh, psych related area. You have oh. some good graphs there. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm just looking forward. So very good. Uh, when yeah. when you go through this, then perhaps you would uh, see how I also it. But you have you have a lot more richer slides here. Oh yes, see? this gets into a lot of things, such as um, if you're interested in psych, uh, that's down there also. And yeah. also, the other thing is the work on uh, the OMG, the uh, DOL, and uh, DOL. Yeah. The, uh, the sharing. Now, that gets into very precise sharing that is possible with a formal notation. You can't do that with uh, knowledge graphs because knowledge graphs are basically, they're at the level of ordinary language that, the, uh, that, the, that any of the terms there in a knowledge graph you basically think of a knowledge graph as just a subset of ordinary language in a kind of a pigeon, pigeon English kind of way. Well, not necessarily, John, but I think that is perhaps the current state of affairs, but it's not uniform across all users. Well, that is true. So, but we would like to, we'd like to encourage people to create knowledge graphs that have a better, more coherent basis than just uh, randomly choosing terms from their domain. Well, that's a question. How can you do that? Good. And yeah, nobody has question. done that. So, John, um, I have, uh, with, with, you know, really taking a lot from your this deck as concepts and linkages, I have yes. done a couple of uh, uh, attempting couple of graphics, new, new um, way of looking at what you have there. Right. But your slides, I, your slides are on the I, meeting page now. Oh, my slides. Okay. Probably your slides are on the page. Yes. Well, what would you prefer? There are two ways to go about it. One is John's is more very comprehensive, uh, uh, like include psych and these and the maturity diagrams and DOL. Do we want to cover all that before or do you want us to present like five, ten slides, which um, give a little bit? 
Okay. I, since this was sort of my suggestion and uh, Todd was skeptical <laughs> that it was going to be worthwhile, maybe if I could start at a very rough uh, level and then Robbie, you could take off and then John could follow with more detail. Because um, um, uh, Ken just uploaded the slide that I put together. Um, so would you do it? Can you share the screen, Janet? Oh, uh, no, I don't think so. Can you just show that one slide? I'm bringing it up right now. Okay, good. But then uh, you, it will, will you take down John's? Okay, I can look at John's downloaded slides. Yeah. Right. Because there's a lot, lot there in John's slide. Oh, very good. But one file, uh, okay. Right. Okay, so the idea here was to, um, to put knowledge graphs in context um, in a way that one would hope to get a, um, a high level overview of the scope of where they fit, what kind of thing they are, and they have multiple facets as you know, discussed. Um, but they're, I, I like John saying that they're lightweight semantic technology because I think that if we think about semantic technologies, as the um, broader class, then um, uh, those, as John said, the motivations have been fairly um, constant from the beginning um, for the, this group that we could call semantic technologies understood broadly, um, you know, from database management systems, um, uh, you know, expert systems, knowledge bases, um, Etc. Um, now the um, so the value proposition for any of these seems to you know, have some basic structure of going from data and metadata um, uh, combining with rules to actionable info. And um, so if we rem if we remember that this is the um, sort of the invariant value proposition, then there are different technologies that have been developed for addressing different facets of this um, in similar but different ways. Um, and uh, it should go from, you know, one wants to be able to go from data, um, uh, you know, especially today, big data, but data through enacted actionable information to some kind of business outcomes. Um, that would be the scope that I think would help um, to keep in mind so that we can um, array the things, uh, the, the detailed elements under this. So, Ravi, if you want to take off from there, or does anybody have anything to say? Um, again, I will request to Ken only to uh, any comments on uh, Janet's thing can be done, but then I would request thereafter to put my slides up. Just a moment, Robbie. As Pardon I bring me? Them, I'm bringing them up Thank now. You. Thank you. Uh, Terry is reacting, I mean, commenting on John's uh, uh, saying that uh, knowledge graphs are at the level of language, ordinary language. Maybe he is talking of executable English. There are, nobody has ever ha used, uh, Google's knowledge graphs are just at the level of ordinary language and uh, um, there is no ontology, well they have sort of, Basically, what they have is a terminology. They don't have an ontology for them. They don't have a formal ontology. It's just a terminology. Ah. Uh -huh. Backed up by statistics. Well, the statistics is an attempt to make their uh, terminology more or less uh, hit the common ballpark of what people use in ordinary language. So okay, the, 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 attempt, the, the use of statistics is an attempt to match ordinary, uh, the sort of mid-level of what people uh, say. 
Yeah, and it's used to uh, meet their their purposes or their goals. So they have very specific well, goals for developing it and using it. And that is modifying, yeah, well, that, that's, in, you know, informing what they are developing. Well, yeah, but basically it's no better than, it's no better than a dictionary. Uh, you can just pick uh, up your... Right, but I think Todd has a good point there, that, that they have um, methods for combining data rules, um, you know, deriving actionable information, insights, and leading to um, business outcomes. That's, that is sort of the, um, the controlling uh, perspective, and, or I guess that's, that's one of the two controlling perspectives. The other one is more the one you're talking about, John, of what they could be doing, um, what they should be doing, you know, what, uh, you know, what, what has already been available that they're ignoring, that kind of thing. But if they're doing something that's adequate um, to get to some kind of outcomes, then, um, then we should acknowledge that as well. Yeah, I mean, these are engineering artifacts, and if you're going to engineer something, you should have some requirements well, that both just randomly flailing about. And developing right. an ontology is a hard work. However, right. it also, uh, in terms of the purpose and the use, what's the time scale that's involved? Um, you know, do you need it right away? Can you wait a bit? How long are you going to be using this thing? Do you really want to... The knowledge, it the knowledge graphs for... Uh, the knowledge graphs for Google is an attempt to make their search to improve their search. Mm -hmm. And that basically means that uh, they're trying to hit some sort of way of finding uh, patterns that in what you're asking and what you're talking about that match uh, yeah. patterns in your ordinary language. Right, that, so that match that patterns in the language of the documents that they are uh, that they have indexed, and so basically, that means exactly right. that means that sort of it, it's at the level of ordinary language. It's not a formal yeah. ontology by any means. Right, but they they are mitigating their problem of ambiguity in a, in, a, in a, I guess a sufficiently um, yeah. appropriate yeah. or accurate way for their needs. Yeah. One, right, one but that the... is in their software. That's in their software. It's not in the graphs. The graphs have no, with the graphs there is no, nothing in the graph that is any think, more precise. Yeah. I well, think I like now. to speak now because oh, I am yeah, Ravi, go ahead. Okay, I have your yeah. slides up. Can you kindly go to the next slide? I'm just uh, going to, and, and I really learned a lot from John's uh, web links, and I see also a lot more in his slides now. But I thought, you know, what are the important things in a typical application of knowledge graph? And uh, I verified it uh, with the presentations from people like Google, et cetera, who presented at the ICWA, the the next slide will show that, but I found, uh, I I just am recalling that two weeks ago, I promised you that I will look at these things. I looked at them, not fully, but whatever I could do last night, I am presenting here. Semantics is important. Triples are really a pre-processed knowledge base from which the so-called knowledge graphs are using them as raw or pre-processed inputs and are going to um, arrange these entities and relations among them. And there are concepts like link embedding and prediction. And the other factors I considered were ontology and DOL and OMS uh, of the OMG. Next. Uh, slide, please. This is interesting. Here, three, four industries were talking, so I left out eBay and eBay and IBM. I did not take because too much material to give you today. So I just abstracted what the Microsoft, Facebook, and Google people presented in this one-year-old conference. Please, next slide. Facebook says the following. 
the largest social graph spanning billions of entities. And they are giving more statistics down. 500 million assertions, 50 million entities, and hundreds of types. So what we are looking at are the industry implementation of knowledge graphs in doing whatever they are supposed to be doing. Maybe the Facebook gets ads or something by searching on all these things and coming out with the right kind of result, which is the, which is the, I, I personally feel that whatever they are getting output target as, it is some kind of ontology input in it. They may not be able to demonstrate it, but the very fact that from random triples, we get relevant results of triples in the output, that is where ontology is playing a part. So next one, please. This is for social media. Uh, Microsoft is, is saying the following. You can read, or to, do I have to read each bullet point? No, this, this is, is what fine. They we can, are we can read on. it. This is this is fine. Yeah. So this is their attack at the knowledge graph. Next is Google. Here it is. They don't have one. They have silos which are domain specific. Uh, they are offered as, you know, along with Watson, which is a favorite subject of John, and I'm sure he'll also cover that. But they are applied it in all these kinds of domains, banking, IT services, security, science, NASA, I mean space, so on. So this is the attack of Google that we can't attack the whole problem. So we are going okay. to go by domain or applications. Next, but notice, please. notice that the top of that line: one billion things, seventy billion facts, and not a single one of those graphs has a formal logic-based definition of any of the terms. The term, every term, is defined in ordinary language. And there is not a single one of those billion facts that you could translate to logic and, and do formal reasoning on. But they must be doing the equivalent of that to get to the desired results in each of these application areas. They're, doing, or they're doing it at the level of a rough English sort of a definition. There's nothing formal in that in the knowledge graph itself. They have a lot of software that they're processing, which yes. is very sophisticated software, but the software is not doing anything with those knowledge graphs, but there's not a single formal definition of any of their uh, terms in those 70 billion facts. Yes, John, but the, the I mean, I took last, last time you told us that uh, uh, think of it as a table with the relations, I mean, with the rows and columns have relations among them. And that, yes, that, that is true. If you, represent, is true. if you represent that as a graph, then it becomes a knowledge graph. There is nothing right. really uh, Basically, a knowledge yeah. graph is just pidgin English. That's all it is. It's just pidgin English, and the terms in the graph are not, are at the level of precision of a typical ordinary word in any uh, language. Uh, there's no formal definition of anything. So, is it fair <laughs> to say that they're doing a um, a bottom up uh, semantic technology? <laughs> Um, uh, I, 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 the words bottom up and top down just are confusing well, they're, unless you. They're just working from the data that they have and the, um, the software, um, whatever rules, expert systems, whatever that they have um, for processing the software, pattern recognition, as you said. Um, but they are not starting with, a, um, with an ontology 
or um, with ontologies or with formal definitions. But they're, they have. They're, yeah. they're, they're grouping but, uh, their. Uh, Yes, They're grouping yes. their terms in the same way that uh, a dictionary, uh, you can t take an ordinary dictionary off your shelf. Let's just take uh, uh, your uh, uh, Merriam-Webster Collegiate Dictionary. And if you look in there, you do see a hierarchy because they have, uh, they defer, de define everything by uh, uh, genus and differentiae. They say that a, a whatchamacallit is a something or other such that, and then more detail. And so you have this, you can take, uh, any dictionary, uh, uh, they started when the, in the olden days, they started with Merriam Webster's Seventh Collegiate, which was available in a computable form. And they just started with that and they built a hierarchy based on, on that. And that is their ontology is just what you derive from the, your ordinary collegiate dictionary. And then you derive a hierarchy from that dictionary. And that's what they yeah, use. And that's the right, level of precision of the knowledge graph. Right, so but Donna, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I was submitting. I was submitting that the dictionary has only word and word meaning synonyms and things like that. Thesaurus yeah, has a little bit more, and then vocabulary. It has nothing more. Nothing no more. They have. They have their own. They have some of their own little con conventions, but those conventions, every convention that they have, is defined at the as at the same level of precision as ordinary English. There's no logic in it. There's nothing at the a, a level of formal logic. Well, John, uh, you shouldn't dismiss the-, the I'm not dismissing it. What I'm saying well, is that you can't that, do any better than that. Well, that's a good start though. If you have good natural language definitions, that's a start because you can't formalize something unless you have some notion of what it is you want to formalize and constrain the interpretations of. And the point I'm making is that you cannot formalize it because what you're doing is you're doing, knowledge graphs are at the same level of precision as a typical document that you find anywhere on the net. And what they're doing is matching words to words, the words in your knowledge graph being matched to the words in your documents. And there, there cannot be any greater precision because the thing is that uh, you might have lots of documents that are very precise in, internally, but in order to find that, you're just using uh, the ordinary English uh, uh, to look through uh, and find those find those things, they're, they're well, Google yeah. just uses the words that occur in those uh, documents. It doesn't do a formal analysis of anything. Well, you well, somehow they have a method. Somehow Google has a method of creating entities and relationships, at least from this dictionary or whatever store you call it. It's yeah. a raw store. Just, just give me two minutes. So continue, probably, Robbie. Okay, I'll yes, finish. continue, continue. Next one, next one. Um, here was an interesting thing I found in a presentation I heard on Neo4j, and this is, what, this is the methodology they uh, used to do the link prediction, which is more like, you know, what do you do with knowledge with search engines? What's the result? So in their case it is, and they are telling you what they are using. It seems to be pretty mature uh, technology relating to use of knowledge graphs. Next, please. Um, I found this interesting that uh, that the uh, this link takes you to what they call embedding. Embedding apparently is a formal word that the Google and these other people use. Seems to be a okay. Is Fine. Now, by the way, I want to make a coin point about this. Their term embedding is a formally defined term that describes precisely what their 
program is using. This is a meta-level term about the program that they are using. It's not a term about the, uh, the labels that are labels on those graphs. The labels on those graphs are at the same level as WordNet or your typical collegiate dictionary. And I, by the way, I'm not criticizing this. I am saying that this is the best you can do if you're going to have a billion documents and a billion uh, node graphs, you cannot be precise in your links because you're going to be uh, using the sort of average kind of uh, meaning that you'll find in a dictionary. You cannot do it with a formal uh, graph because the data itself is not formal. And uh, to claim that those labels on the graphs are formally defined would be meaningless. You cannot define them formally because then that would, uh, to put it another way, a formal definition narrows something down to make it extremely precise. If it's that precise, yeah. no, no, no. your a likelihood of matching anything else that precisely is zero. The only thing you can do with a knowledge graph is a vague mapping. It's vague, 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 vague. And I want to emphasize well, vague, and no. that's important. I'm not criticizing it. I'm emphasizing vagueness is essential. And without, well, and if you make it precise, mm -hmm. it won't work. Well, that's not true either, John. But first, before we go uh, further, I, hold on a second. There is, uh, hold on, John. Hold no, just you, Robbie, you, Robbie, hold on, John, yeah, yeah. a moment. Uh, the previous okay, I'll hold on. The previous slide that you had, you had pictures of two people. Did you get their permission to use their, their images? And the only reason I ask is because these slides are going to be made public, and if we don't have their permission, we can get into trouble. OK, I will uh, send an email uh, to Neo4j. That's the only one. The other one is a published one. The other one is ICW publication. Oh, that's fine, yeah. So, Neo for the I will either we can remove it if you think. Well, just the, those images, the, those people's images. Oh, uh, people. Yeah. Yeah. So, John, I I wanted to ask the um, the thing I don't understand is the that's why I called it bottom up because it seemed like it was a um, you know starting with what's loose and what's there and what's natural language and um, vague. And then the question is, where do you go from there? And, um, you know, can you apply VivoMind techniques or embeddings or you oh, know, definitely, other? Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so it's not. So the knowledge graph part of it is doesn't get you that far, but then it is a, a starting point and um, so I was thinking of that as bottom in contrast to um, the, yeah, uh, uh, the upper level ontology or the micro theories, which are sort of in the middle. Um, this well, is sort of starting well, with what's there, graphing what's there. Yeah. John, can I ask you a question? Uh, yeah, I, I don't understand. I, I, I think of it as vague and precise. And uh, I, when you talk about vagueness versus precision, I don't know what, which one is the top and the bottom. You know, it's just, it's, there's a continuum at one end you have vagueness and at the other end you have precision. But the point is that precision is not desirable. Uh, but the point that you have to emphasize is that vagueness is not a criticism. I'm saying that vagueness is absolutely essential with a knowledge graph because you cannot have a precise mapping of your query to a billion, uh, uh, you know, uh, billions of documents out there. If you tried to do that, uh, you would you would find zero matches to get a to get something that is just precise. What yeah. you want to do is to get something in the correct ballpark that will narrow it down to something that is very close to what you're looking for. But it will always yeah. be close to, and if it's pre and uh, that. You cannot have precision. That's what I want to emphasize. Precision no, John, is John, impossible at this level. Absolutely John. correct. If I may speak, uh, you are absolutely correct because look at nature, and I'll just use a few keywords: quantum mechanics. Look at probability theory. Look at the number of stars in the sky. Look at anything realistic. 
you will have approximate you will have similarities but you will never have the match i am looking at alpha centauri and its characteristics i will only find it in alpha centauri so it will match on itself so john is absolutely correct that what you are looking is a grouping of similar things a thing of similar relationships things within a domain uh, approximate yeah robin that's right am i right to your point hold on john to your point uh some i want to go down a little series of questions here john would you agree that um a knowledge graph has some notion of a schema behind it no whether that however you create that schema is something else but there is some notion of a schema well let's put it this way the google knowledge no, graph no, 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 john, is no I, schema i'm looking for this is there not is no a such thing made. as a schema for them it, well assuming yeah, there's that, only domain based domain based some assuming. kind of Assuming well, or let me back. Right, uh, okay, if I might let me interject. This is George okay, Robert. Let, let me back up. The, one. I'd, I'd like to suggest that uh, the nature of most domains is is one of dynamics, and in a dynamic environment, you're never going to get precision in terminology because there's always new terminology being added, other terminology which is changing meaning, and other terminology which is essentially outdated or superannuated. I think the uh, the term fuzzy is probably a better term than vague because there are technologies yeah. available yeah. to deal with fuzzy. Uh, yeah. Vague sort of sounds yeah. uh, pejorative in, in my thinking. Uh, no, moreover, vague is not pejorative. I want to emphasize vague is not pejorative. It's essential. We must have vagueness. Uh, and without I, vagueness, you've got nothing. Okay. I don't disagree That's with it. I'm just uh, offering a different thing, term. Same thing we can, same thing I can say that there is uncertainty in any deterministic thing there is a level or circle or sphere of uncertainty around the target that we are after it, i think the difficulty though is everything everything is changing everything is true to that extent and certainly domains are changing and inter domain interoperations are changing boundaries are changing and then therefore there are some intersection domains are being thought of as the place where people like to work like the, i can think of element. clinic and health research in overlapping domains the missing element in that whole uh, process if you look at it from the point of view of a knowledge graph is that the relationships themselves provide proximity and provide mathematical relations to be able to derive relationships that are more meaningful and can uh, probably statistically stand up uh, as, as working relationships, regardless of the language so, uh, uh, used. The whole line of research by Kathy Lasky and the group uh, out at the University in Maryland, uh, that is the only group that is attacking semantics and ontologies from a statistical and probabilistic perspective. But John is absolutely right in emphasizing that the nature of things is uncertain. And well, Robert, point, can you okay. that yeah. let, 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 uh, let me restate this in a That's clearer it. way. Let me restate this in a clearer way. The point is that precision is equivalent to fragile and breakable. So precision is essential. Whenever you think of precision, think of something that's crystalline, precise, a crystal that is fragile, breakable, and uh, it's, it, uh, and think of vagueness as something that means robust and strong. Uh, and when you lo look at these uh, uh, earthquakes, a house, a wooden house, that's uh, creaky, uh, a, a bamboo house uh, with a straw root, uh, they will withstand the strongest earthquakes. But a, uh, a very sharp, sharply defined, precise uh, mortal, with precise mortal, uh, mortar, uh, that is the first thing that's going to uh, break in an earthquake. And so when you think of, uh, and the, and when you talk in engineering terms, there is always 
the uh, uh, the tolerance. There is always a tolerance that there is uh, there that is essential. Yeah. And when you talk about building a bridge, bridges move. They are designed to uh, expand and contract uh, with the heat. And if you have a bridge that it was rigid, that would crash immediately as soon as the temperature range uh, goes up, just uh, up or down a few degrees. So, and you look at the railroad tracks, they're designed in such a way that they can expand and contract without breaking. So that the, it's absolutely essential to have that precision there. It's essential to recognize that if you want to have uh, the ability to index and search through uh, billions of nodes on the, on the uh, World Wide Web, you must have vagueness. Vagueness is good. A precision is fragile. And uh, um, the, that's the important distinction you have to I, make. I, but I, but the I earthquake... Agree, but I think I want to reach end of my slides, if I may be allowed a couple more to go, that's all. Go okay, ahead. Uh, fine. So, John, shall I go ahead? And oh, sure, can... please. Uh, yeah, obviously, uh, the, uh, that uh, my slides are, will never be used, this, at least not today. Well, I want, I want to uh, let us all just quickly look at what I have done, and I'll just speak. Okay, yeah, fine, of... fine, fine. I'll, okay, go through that. Let's go ahead and go to the next one, Ken. Thank you. And the gentleman who asked me a question, kindly look at the chat. If you don't have access to chat, tell me your name, I will uh, email you. Uh, so these are the John's uh, references. Only I referred to the first one. Next slide. The link card. The link mentions these. Now, I independently looked at, I said, okay, so what other things are involved? If we want to use knowledge graphs, some notion of ontology. And so John has been telling us a lot about IKL, please, EOL, which is an OMG uh, standard for ontology. It's, it's a lot better than ODM, but it is a lot more complex in concept. I went through the entire area. There. So this is about these two languages of standards. Next, please. This is a, I thought this could be a very simple diagram to convey that knowledge graphs visualized are like this. They, we start with some kind of pre-processed collection of entities and relationships. Then we do some kind of search. In the search process, we use reasoning and machine learning and AI and so on. So we have some thought process reasoning, some algorithms and math. And then we, what are we targeting? Some results, which is nothing but an organized set of these collection of triples. These triples were raw material. Final material is like the triples but it reduces the irrelevant triples in the process. So knowledge graphs are used for search. Search is used to reach some target, whether it be an advertisement or something else, as a monsoon result or whatever. Next slide, please. So this is one depiction I have created. This is a very simple, another way of telling the same thing. We have random sources of information. We have some kind of processes that give us things like entity relationships or triples. So we create the triples. Then we apply these ontologies, semantics, AI, ML, and search engine to come with meaningful outputs uh, of relevance from billions to a few that we are targeting. Last slide, please. This is another attempt of saying the same thing. If it is a text source, we can do NLP. The database, we can do SQL. Its image and image classifiers are there, including AI now for image classification. But earlier, they were just based Gaussian this or that, or training set, or 
clustered uh, approaches to images. And then there are audio, which you go for word uh, phenomes or phonetics, you know, how it's spoken, what's spoken, etc. And uh, we have to worry about which domains we are talking about, applying the knowledge graph to. So there is overlap, there are schema concepts, there are common vocabularies in those domains, and then triple store suite that as a result of this left side is the raw material, middle is processed triples, and then we apply these last transformations to get the desired result in the blue circle. So this is these were two, three ways I thought of depicting knowledge graphs and what we are after uh, as the results using knowledge graphs. Full stop. Okay, now let me summarize the whole point. The point is that the precision in the software that processes these graphs is important, but the graphs themselves are as vague as ordinary language. They must be as vague as ordinary language because that's, what, that's where they come from. They come from somebody as asking a question, in fact, when you're asking a question in Google, you're much vaguer than you are when you're not as precise as even stating a precise sentence in ordinary English. You just put a bunch of key words. And then what Google does is to take those bunches of key words and matches them to the patterns that they have in the, uh, uh, in their, uh, uh, that the patterns that they have in their knowledge graphs, which are also using vague words and the important point is that they are designed to be to give you vague uh, and matches and uh, okay right now I see that slide number three if you look at my slide number three uh, the point is vagueness and ambiguity in natural languages result from the need to talk about anything from any possible perspective and that is the fundamental point of a knowledge graph it's designed so that you can talk about absolutely anything from any perspective and you want to be able to use it to match with uh, some close match to some other document on the web that uh, talks about similar things also from a similar perspective. Now the likelihood that the, the words that you use for asking your question are identical to the words in the document that um, you're searching for is probably kind of small. Now, it may be that if you're talking in, say, a specific field such as organic chemistry, then you'll be using terminology in chemistry that is precisely defined. And so there will be a lot of hits that will match uh, documents. But then the words that you use to connect those things are your own personal uh, way you happen to be talking about at that moment, and uh, that you're, you want to find a document that will use some similar kinds of patterns, but probably in different uh, terminology. And that's where the pattern matching that they use can get greater precision from the patterns of words. So even though a particular uh, triple is extremely vague, and your ordinary language is extremely vague, when you have a whole pattern of pattern of patterns of these triples matched up, you get a, a larger graph that, um, for which the likelihood that the graph that you have uh, and the graph that uh, uh, the document that you want to have, that the, that the precision comes in the fact that uh, that combination that you have constructed with that, that whole pattern of patterns is not likely to match another pattern of patterns that's on a different topic. So for example, let's say that um, you're uh, working at uh, one company, say Acme Electronics, and somebody else is working at another company called uh, Beta, uh, Beta Transmissions, and the terminology in your business and the terminology in their business are likely to be very different, but if they are happen to be talking about exactly the same kind of widget, uh, their 
patterns of words that match uh, Acme's widgets and the patterns of words that match uh, Beta's widgets will have a similar structure so that the, uh, so the, somebody was using the word schema. Uh, I think the better word is the graph. The whole graph structure has an analogy to the graph structure in the other. And it's not, uh, the analogy is not an exact one-to-one -one match. It's an analogy of structure to structure. And so even though uh, there may be billions of uh, documents on the web that uh, happen to have um, lots of, use lots of the same words, that pattern that Al Acme is using and the pattern that Beta is using happen to have a similar structure and the mechanisms that uh, Google and the and Facebook and these other uh, companies use for matching patterns to patterns will indeed hit on a match. And that's basically what uh, VivoMind does. The VivoMind graphs can match precise formally defined graphs that are as formal as any formal logic or as any uh, computer, but uh, that uh, the methods for doing the analogies are based on approximations. And they, you need that approximation because the likelihood that different companies will use exactly the same terminology for their inventions is very slim. However, because there are certain structural patterns in designing widgets, the likelihood that the Acme widgets and the beta widgets will match up is, comes from the fact that the structures map, even though the words don't have an exact mapping. Now, that's, um, that is basically... Uh, oh, very, it's, very, yes? very valuable okay. point you have brought. John, you have brought a very valuable point. Sorry to interrupt, but the value is that it's not a single triple. It's a pattern of lots of these, and it is a close it's a pattern of multiple triples patterns. that match uh, create a larger graph. And you're matching graphs yes. to graphs. And even though the words in one graph don't exactly match the words in another graph, the patterns of graphs do match. So that's the point. Are you saying that Vivo Mind can do that faster uh, and very yes. accurate? Yes, Google Mind uh, does that by using graph to graph match instead of a, uh, uh, a node by node match. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we are so recording. Uh, so good. let's see if we can get back to the original topic of the meeting, which was diagrams. Um, John. Uh, the diagrams I thought were really interesting were on page slides 34 and 39. Okay. Can we so, look at those? Uh, yeah, so let's do that. Let's go down to those. 34, sorry, that's 35. Okay, 34 is observing, learning, reasoning, and acting, and it has a uh, it has a cycle. Uh, this is the from uh, a work that I've been doing. Uh, I've been talking about this cycle for uh, uh, years. In fact, my uh, uh, the, the not, uh, some of these graphs come from uh, my book, and uh, it came out in 2000. And uh, since then, I've been refining it. But the point that's interesting, if you look at uh, slide number 34, the title there says "Observing, Learning, Reasoning, and Acting," and it shows. Uh, 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 there's a picture of Charles Sanders Peirce uh, in the middle, and uh, he he had this uh, notion that um, reasoning takes place in a cycles and cycles that re get refinement and refinement and refinement as we go through. So that by induction we observe things in the world, and from multiple observations we form uh, patterns. We discover patterns that occur, uh, and we throw them into what I call a knowledge soup. That is this, this sort of collection of everything you possibly know. And then when you've got a problem with abduction, you pull out some patterns in there and you try to form a theory. And that theory is a nice crystalline uh, structure, very precise, logic-based crystalline theory. And then uh, the uh, uh, there's an arrow at the top that says cycle and refine that theory. Then using that theory, you make a deduction, which makes a prediction 
that prediction predicts something about the world and makes a predicts that something next will happen next and the action that you make is something that you do that may be some uh, perform some operation of some sort or it may just be that you go out and you uh analyze and look at, you just look at something to make another observation. So you perform an action on the world, which gives you more data, and then by induction, you get uh, more patterns from which you form patterns that go back into your knowledge soup, then by, and then you keep on cycling around. Now, the interesting thing is that um, I developed this pattern based on what I had studied and also from uh, not my knowledge of the kinds of things that were wor working in artificial intelligence and also from the writings that uh, Peirce wrote. And uh, after I did that, I was giving a lecture on this and somebody in the audience said, oh, that looks like an OODA loop. And if you uh, look at the next slide uh, that, um, wait, let's see, that, oh, I, okay, uh, I, I'm trying to page through. Okay, if we, if we go to slide, uh, yeah, it's up. Go, go to the next slide, number 35. That's the Uras loop. And that is the observe, orient, decide, and act. And this is by John Boyd. And Boyd had this idea that uh, um, this came, uh, John Boyd was an air, uh, was an airline, uh, uh, a fighter plane pilot, and he engaged in various, uh, uh, I think he did that in the Korean War. And he was engaged in these um, dogfights uh, at jet speed age, and he uh, uh, then became a trainer, training other pilot, fighter, fighter pilots how to observe and respond rapidly in the midst of a, uh, a battle. And so he said that there are four steps uh, in this, and the first is observe, the visual input, uh, orient, and then you orient yourself to the situation, then dis make a decision, and then act. And this action, this all has to take place at millisecond speeds because you have to outthink and outact and outperform the other guy, or else, uh, in order to be the one who shoots him down, or else, uh, and avoid getting shot down yourself. And if you go to 36, slide 36. This is the extended OODA loop, and this is one that uh, this is a, an ex this uh, picture comes straight out of uh, uh, Wikipedia. And over years, uh, Boyd generalized this and applied this to decision-making processes of any kind. And he had cycles of cycles within cycles. There are major cycles which can take place in the uh, in, say minutes. Well, these minor cycles take place at seconds and milliseconds, or then you can have a study that take, takes place over weeks, days, or weeks, or months, or even years, and you have cycles within cycles, within cycles, within cycles. And the interesting thing is that uh, Boyd's OODA loop and um, the, uh, now, Peirce did not draw the, draw the diagram, but he described the operations in such a way that I drew that diagram. And my diagram turned out to be uh, very similar to the uh, OODA loop, which uh, somebody in my audience happened to mention. And I looked that up and I said, oh, yeah, that's right. Now, if you go to slide 37, uh, this is another uh, article. This is an article written by uh, John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, Aaron Sloman and uh, some of their colleagues and they had this architecture which has a lot more complexity in it and there's a uh, uh, a pointer on that where you can find that find that article and their uh, article is very complex and has lots of uh, arrows back and forth but if you look at it they have that uh, this uh, same uh, same four points there there is the uh, and notice that there are these arrows that go and the bottom arrow goes to the left and the top arrow goes to the right and then it comes down and you can find parallels in uh, this uh, th their cognitive affect architecture that maps to Boyd's OODA loop and it also maps to uh, the uh, Persian style triangle then go to 38 and this is uh, this is by uh, Albus, who is a uh, James Albus is uh, was one of the pioneers in working on uh, uh, applying neuroscience to uh, analyze the patterns and patterns in order to understand how do people think 
and how can you use that information for improving uh, your own reasoning processes? And notice how uh, and there's an ask. You can look at the our article there to get more detail. There's a fairly long article, and Albus. That was the last publication that Albus wrote before he died, and. Uh, 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 what my diagram here is a combination of several diagrams that Albus had. I put them all together in one, and and he also had that same uh, same diagram that you have the actuators that that um, uh, act upon the world, and then the sensors detect information from the world that goes to the sensory processing, which goes into making using world models and value judgments and a knowledge base from which you get a goal which is some sort of a decision that uh, then you uh, which decides what to, which makes it uh, determines what how to, how the actuators should make further operations upon the world so this is basically albus was a started out as a uh, uh, an engineer and a computer scientist and he got deeper and deeper into neuroscience and uh, he developed this uh, cognitive architecture which uh, has a very strong similarity to the uh, architecture of the uh, uh, others. And then if you go to 39, uh, the question is how do you implement the cycles? And the idea is that the basic, uh, the basic operation that you use for all four of them is analogies. Analogies can be used in, in determining what uh, what action to perform and uh, analogies are used to perform induction, analogies are used to perform abduction, analogies are used for belief revision, and they're also used for deduction and so on. So that at a informal level, analogy, analogy, analogy is what's driving this uh, cycle. And uh, different kinds of technologies can be used uh, in computers uh, and artificial intelligence. And I just put down uh, just a few terms. I could uh, expand that to a large uh, number of uh, different systems that people have designed over the years. But the simplest, uh, if you go to from starting from a prediction, a stimulus response uh, thing is just a uh, pattern match. You pattern some, you match some pattern to the stimulus and that suggests a response. Uh, or you can have some canned procedure that says if you have found this, you trigger some program. You can have some kind of perception action cycle and, or your analogies. And then from the world, you can do induction by neural networks, by Bayesian nets, by various methods of pattern recognition. And from that, you uh, various kinds of machine learning methods. From the data you get from the world, that goes into your, uh, into your uh, knowledge soup. And then by methods of knowledge discovery, statistical methods, data mining, you uh, pull out information that gives you an abduction, your best guess about what to do and how, what to add to your theory. And so you, by belief revision, you add this new information to a very precise crystalline theory. And then by deduction, uh, again, you can apply planning systems, the inference engines, theorem provers, and analogies, and all sorts of other things to make an inference or a, uh, deduction, which makes a predi prediction, and then you cycle through. And the point is that you can go round and round and round those cycles, and you're always going through the same sort of uh, patterns. And by the way, the analogy engine is what uh, th that's the that's the basis for cognitive memory, and that's the technology that VivoMind developed. And uh, that first major application of that technology was applied to software engineering, uh, to legacy re-engineering uh, in uh, the Y2K stuff. And the idea was, the first application was to uh, do re soft legacy re-engineering of all of the software of a major corporation and to uh, analyze 40 years of data and software that they had developed and the documentation about it. And this required a matching of the precise, uh, precise data to the vague, ordinary English. And uh, that was, a, I, I gave a talk about that uh, 
earlier where, where I t discussed the legacy reengineering project. And that legacy reengineering project showed that you can use exactly the same te kind of technology for the most precise data that comes out of your computer programs and the much vague, much more vague uh, ordinary language. And the idea is that you can analogies between the vague English in your reports and the uh, precise uh, data from your uh, computer programs enables you to do to find where in that uh, documentation any particular program happens to be uh, described. And the idea is that what the company wanted was a cross-reference between their documents and their programs. They had 40 years of computer programs and they wanted to relate different programs from different age, uh, from different uh, uh, eras of their company written by different programmers using different uh, terminologies and different ways of writing the programs and relate them to the documentation, emails, which consists of emails, handwritten notes, and um, reports and uh, computer uh, documentation and the commentary, the comments that are written inside the COBOL programs and the uh, uh, IBM's JCL, the job control language, and, the, and also SQL. So the, the precise language was SQL, uh, JCL, and COBOL. And then you also had the vague stuff in your reports and you wanted to match the vague to the precise so that you get all the cross references and also show detect errors where you found structures that were mentioned in the documentation that were different from the structures that were found in the programs themselves. And the soft, the VivoMind software did find discrepancies in that documentation. And in 15 weeks, 15 person weeks, it was eight, actually eight weeks of elas elapsed time, but 15 person weeks of human time, uh, they found exactly and uh, produced a CD-ROM, a, a, a nice uh, CD, a CD that contained uh, exactly what the company uh, was looking for, and namely a complete uh, cross-reference of ev all their documentation and programs. And that's what Accenture had estimated would take 40 person years to do, two years of elapsed time with about 20 people uh, over the, an average of 20 people over those two years, that's 40 person years of work to produce that same CD with all that documentation in it that, that did all that cross-referencing. Aaron Majumdar and Andre Leclerc <coughs> did that in 15 person weeks by using that cognitive memory system. Now that's, that's an example where precision and, uh, uh, precision and vagueness are both important and the system mapped them, mapped them ba uh, back and forth. And I, I, I didn't really like to use the term uh, up top, uh, up, uh, you know, bottom up or top down because they, they don't think of it in terms of bottom up or top down. They think of it in terms of their documentation and things of their programs. And it's more like a continuum that there is some of the programs are more precise. Some of the documentation is more precise, like a technical description of the software. And some of the documentation is more vague in the sense that it's a, uh, uh, just a, uh, and uh, just a bare bones description. So how's that? Any comments about that? Hello? Yes, uh, uh, functional, <laughs> functional descriptions and also sometimes the uh, level of depth in COBOL uh, copybook. These two apparent trans uh, thing has, is able to match both these, the vague functional description and little more precise COBOL copy book level. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, John. But uh, we've run over, we've run out of time. In fact, we've gone over time. Um, okay. So I, uh, but I think that this we really haven't covered this very well. Yeah, I mean, your presentation has been fantastic. 
But um, well, yeah, yeah. I I I didn't know exactly where to go on this because I didn't know what people were aiming at. But I think from this discussion, it clarifies. I think that uh, I came to a realization myself of uh, that uh, point that the knowledge graphs are vague and they must be vague. The vagueness is a is a plus for them because you because precision you can't do the precise matching. Uh, without, uh, from the, for example, just going from COBOL to JCL, you can't, do, they are two very precise languages and they are so different that you can't really do that matching. But if you do the matching by mean, means of going through the ordinary English, that, uh, well, uh, I'll have to restate this in, in another way, but the point is that, yes, the idea is that knowledge graphs are vague, Vagueness is good, and if you want to prefer the word fuzzy, I don't care. Fuzzy and vague to me are the same basic words, just slightly different uh, uh, operations that you perform on it. And the idea is that you need that vagueness and fuzziness because if you make it more precise, the system will break. Good, good. So, um, so what we can do now is, yeah. is uh, meet again next week and um, so we have this diagram which i think is quite excellent and then we also have the diagram that uh, we got from janet and the material from ravi so there's Yeah, and I have the original, uh, the original diagrams. If you want to embed them in any file, I have the original book diagrams that I can send you. So we also have this. Um, so I think we have uh, a good starting point for uh, for starting to dis for for discussing a diagram for our uh, summit. Yeah, and I, I think multiple diagrams is probably what we should aim for for the communique. That would be great to have multiple connected um, diagrams. But and John, the, uh, none of us really knew what we were aiming towards. So it's uh, what you presented was really helpful. There was a lot of enthusiastic response on the chat. Um, so we're just figuring this out as we're going along. Yeah, and then uh, and then of course I fully is, agree with what uh, Janet said about John's presentation. It opened our eyes on what, okay, well, how they anyway, are doing it. How they are doing it. I didn't know exactly what people you. were interested in, so I put, threw everything into those 40s. I, not everything, I got more, of the, the, but this looked like everything that seemed to be relevant. But I think that slide number three is important, where it says that that you cannot be more precise and uh, that precision, when you're talking, the reason why people can communicate so effectively in ordinary language is that the uh, language is vague enough that people can get a general idea of what you're talking about from just a vague statement. And then to be precise, what they do is drill down to get into the, uh, to align what their own personal terminology so that during uh, during the course of a di of a dialogue people refine their ideas until they agree in fact that's basically what we have been doing during this hour we started with sort of vague ideas and by discussing we uh, drilled down to a point where we could relate our more detailed ideas to one another yes yeah. yes yeah. thank you okay so um so let's uh, continue this uh, uh, discussion about the uh, diagrams uh, next week. Is that okay? Fine. And Kenneth, the subject of uh, discussion of the diagrams is, or the goal of the discussion of these diagrams is? To get an intro, I thought, Todd. What we want I is a, the... you want one or more diagrams which are going to be, um, uh, expressing in diagrammatic form um, the topic of the summit. Okay. So that's that's basically the goal. We want something that 
we can show as you know this this is what our summit um, is all about and then it'll be text associated with that but diagrams carry a lot of you know they're they do carry a lot of meaning if we design them well <laughs> yes I can okay. so that's is that reasonable as a goal sure. yes yeah. Yes, I think and, word, words yeah. missing around the diagram as well as the diagram could be the focus of next meeting. Right. Okay. So I will. And then uh, they'll be they'll be useful for the communique. <coughs> Excuse me. So yes. for both the summit yes. and the communique. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. So uh, let me stop. The